All right, guys, so if you just walked in, we have made our presentation interactive through a new county approved tool for teachers. Um, it's called Pear Deck, Pear, like the fruit, you see there? Um, so if you would like to join and have um, our presentation on your devices, just go to joinpd.com and enter our classroom code. Confuse olives help green flashlights. <laughs> of course. I don't know, but yes. Um, there are some interactive components to our presentation if you do join the class um, that you guys will see on your devices as we go. Um, just a couple of things for our presentation. We have a lot of content to get through in a short amount of time. So we are going to, and we're also recording. So we are gonna ask that you guys hold your questions until the end of the presentation. We do have two stopping points in here for you guys to type in your questions that we can answer at the end of, um, of our presentation. Uh, we don't want to shortchange you guys for the last part of the presentation. We want to make sure that you guys get all the content um, and get the full value of what we are trying to um, give you guys so you can help your, your kiddos. Any questions right now? Okay, perfect. All right. So you guys should be here for assistive technology to support executive functioning. Uh, we have a short video here. It better explains what executive functioning is better than I can. All right, so what is executive function? So executive function is like the CEO of the brain. It's in charge of getting things done from the planning stages to the final deadline. Is there an app for that? <laughs> we get this a lot. Um, what you guys will be seeing today, you guys will be seeing a combination of school-based technologies as well as there are a few apps that are included in our presentation. Um, we are looking at our first thing is first is the least restrictive environment. What do they already have at the schools? What's available to their teachers? What's available um, at the school-based level? Um, and working with our teachers and our school staff um, and teams to make sure that they are implementing what they already have at the school level. They have so many things. Um, I'm sure you guys see things come through the door all the time. Um, so we are looking at um, technology for all learners. All right, so is there an app for that? Emma. Huh? Emma. Uh, Emma. Emma. <laughs> Emma. <laughs> Emma. <laughs> Emma. <laughs> All right, so kids who struggle with executive functioning, um, they have issues uh, with any of the tasks that requires them to plan, organize, time management, flexible thinking. All of these um, may be a challenge for them. 
you guys haven't gone to understood.org, it is a wonderful website for parents and educators. Um, there is a parent tool kit on here, um, but inside of understood.org, they have a simulator called Through Your Child's Eyes. And it is a simulator to um, let you see through the lens of your child what it would be like to struggle um, with some of their um, issues. So they have math, they have organization, they have reading, um, they've got writing, attention issues. So I'm actually gonna have Jeff come up here and do this. So if you go to experience it, and then you can pick your um, grade that your child is currently in. I'll just do sixth grade right in the middle. And then what is your child struggling with? Um, they change it? Hold on. This is unscripted, by the way. I don't know what's about to happen to me. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Maybe I got to go back here. Um, I'm afraid of this choice. All right. This one? Here we go. All right. Mm -hmm. I don't know why it's not working. All right, here we go. So it has a video. Um, hopefully it will come at the end or maybe I have to go back and do it. But um, it must have changed the website on us. But this is a simulator for organization and time management issues. So what Jeff is going to experience is shapes that are falling from, <laughs> from the top of the screen with directions being thrown at him. Mm -hmm. um, and so we'll, we'll ask him how he felt after this experience is over. I'm already confused. <laughs> so the game is called Catch Up, and he's going to catch the falling shapes in the bucket. All right. When you're ready, go ahead and start. Yep, you're good. Mm -hmm. So you click on, click on the problem that you want to go to. Go. <laughs> Only circles. Only circles. <laughs> Circles, circles and squares. You got to avoid them. Now catch only the triangles. Go <laughs> 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 away. Afraid to bump into another one. Now catch everything. <laughs> now catch everything. <laughs> now avoid catching everything. <laughs> 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 Catch every other oh, triangle. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, no. Oh, no. No, no. <laughs> I was committed. <laughs> All right. Oh, my gosh. What'd I do? So, Jeff, how did you feel about that? Uh, it was, it's a little overwhelming. Uh-huh. To little, say the least. Oh, uh, yeah? Yeah. A little frustrating? A little, uh, yeah. And then especially with people watching. Uh-huh. <laughs> Uh -huh. Uh -huh. A little overwhelming. That's a little nerve-wracking. Right. Mm -hmm. Maybe a student in the classroom with their peers and teachers and trying to right. get their self organized and, mm -hmm. and manage their time to get um, an assignment done. And I wanted to do well for you all. I really yes. did. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you. Thank Let's go around the applause. <laughs> all right. So. So is the idea is that a student 
students with the uh, uh, not so strong executive functional skills is how the brain functions? Is that the idea from this game? It's the simulated, so it, yeah, it may be what you're experiencing. Um, oh, sorry. The question was, is this, um, is this what you're, is this supposed to simulate what a child with executive functioning may experience on a daily basis, right? And so this site, understood.org, um, tries to do its best to kind of give you a glimpse into what um, a student for a teacher or your child may, may experience. So the simulator, like Jeff was saying, he got really frustrated, he kind of got overwhelmed with it. Um, so that could be some of the feelings that um, your child is experiencing. Um, doing certain tasks. And then there was, I don't know why it's not doing the videos. So usually they do an introduction yeah. video, kind of explaining what's going to happen, and then after the simulation is over, it comes back and it um, kind of recaps. You know. Yeah, I don't know why it's. Yeah, let's do Scott. Scott's one of our favorites. Yeah, they have revamped it. Here we go. My name is Scott. I'm in the fifth grade, and I struggle every day to stay organized. I'm one of the most or unorganized people I know. It sort of feels like you're the worst because you're always late to all the classes. Why did everyone else just finish their book report and I'm just start? You don't want to admit that you can't do it because you just can't find your binder. I'm still on the first thing and everyone else is on the third thing because they can just flip through their binder, go ahead and out the door in 30 minutes and I need to stay behind and keep looking for it. Okay, I just can't find anything. It just feels bad. The hardest thing is just putting it, putting everything in the right place. I'm getting better at it, but it's still really hard for me. Instead of just saying I'm not good enough to find my paper for the right class, saying that I can do it and that I don't give up on it, like my homework folder. I put the homework that I need to do in one side, the homework I've done in the other side. And now I use labels in my binder for every binder. So like, if I am late, I'm not as late, because now I can find my the things in my binder. And now, if I'm, I'm not usually late to uh, subjects, but when I am, I'm only like five minutes late, not 10. I get to do what everyone else does and not feel left out because I'm the last one. Woohoo, I made it to social studies on time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then. <coughs> there was a ending part. I don't know. They've changed the website on us. All right. So if you guys don't know, um, ATS, our department, has a public website on, on, on fcps.edu. Inside of our website, we have a web page about executive functioning. So on here, it gives you an introduction, and it also goes through a lot of the tools that we are talking about today. So just so you guys are aware, we do have a public website. Okay, so our department uses a student information guide that we give out to um, our teachers to gather some information. And we focus on the four areas of executive functioning based on the Wisconsin Assistive Technology Initiative. Um, we focus on self-management, information management, time management, and materials management. So our presentation is broken up into these four areas and you guys will see tools in each of these um, areas that may help support your child. Sorry, is this from elementary school level, right? It's for all. All. All right. Jeannie. Good morning. Um, I know this is kind of hard to see up here, but 
the first area of executive functioning that we're going to be discussing today is self-management. Um, <coughs> as you can see, uh, there's a gentleman here who's a little bit um, out of sort or out of place. He's a little bit older than the rest of our team here. This is David. Um, he's out of Loudoun County. He's one of our colleagues. So if you can just take a minute, and as you're reading each of these word bubbles, just think about, you know, what's kind of describing your child, or maybe it's describing something that you know, maybe a friend, or maybe even just yourself. What is self-management? When we ask the student to self-manage themselves, we're asking them to sort through a constant stream of sensory information. Thank you. And we're asking them to employ self-regulation strategies to do all of these things at once. We're asking them to monitor and regulate their own thinking, kind of monitor their attention, right? their behavior, their emotions, and their social interactions. That's a lot. When um, self-management enables us to set priorities and resist impulsive actions or responses. The tools that I'm going to be talking about today are going to help our students to attain those goals. Uh, before we get into the tools, uh, we want to show you this video um, based off the 1960s, 1970s study called the Marshmallow Test. I'm sure many of you have heard of this before. Um, this is based off the psychologist's study, uh, Walter Mitchell, um, called the Marshmallow Test, and it was um, focused on delayed gratification. They had a sample of students that they said, we're, we are going to give you a reward, something such as a marshmallow or a cookie or a pretzel. Then we're going to leave for a certain amount of time. If you can hold back from eating that reward or that cookie, then when we come back, we'll give you a second one. So um, you're going to see in this video that um, these students, some of these students have a pretty easy time, well-ish, doing it. <laughs> Um, but some are just like doing everything they can to just try to resist eating that marshmallow. Um, as you're watching, kind of look at some of the self-regulation strategies that they're doing to help them cope with this, please.
Lindsay, you want to repeat, or Jean, you want to repeat that question? The question was, um, mm. so if you go on Pinterest, would you just type in low-tech strategy cards? Yes, just type in low-tech strategy cards or strategy <laughs> cards um, for students with disabilities or self-regulation, and that should be a good search for you. This is, a, the next tool is self-management checklist. This is a little bit more higher tech than the low-tech strategy that I just showed you. Um, this is asking you to use a laptop to go to this website, Intervention Central, and it's a self-check behavior checklist maker. You can go to this website, or if you have an older student, you can ask them to go to the website and create their own behavior checklist. So you can quickly create checklists that students can use to monitor their behavior in their classroom or at home. Um, you can use, the, use it to help students manage their behaviors in academically demanding and research settings. So there's a lot um, to choose from. You know, this website has a lot of, of different um, things you can select, and you can really tailor it to your specific child or your student. Is this like the strategy cards is the question. Um, it's a self-monitoring card. So again, if a student is exhibiting a certain behavior when it comes to something specific in their class, then they would focus their strategy um, monitoring card 
so that they can, again, self-manage their behavior. So yeah. I'm sorry, is it real time or continuing back? Or <laughs> well, you would, if you, they're continuing, is it real time? <laughs> if they're <continuing laughs> <laughs> after the fact. So if they're exhibiting a behavior consistently, then that's something where you'd want to be able to go and then create a checklist for them so that they can, it's like more longer term. If it's a behavior that happens sporadically that's once in a while, does that make sense? <laughs> um, the next tool is the Iris Star Legacy Module. This is a mo great module for educators to um, visit. It comes out of the um, Vanderbilt University. Um, and this module is from the Iris Center, and it describes how teachers can help students stay on task by learning to regulate their behavior. So this module focuses on the four, four strategies self-monitoring, self-instruction, goal setting, and self-reinforcement. So each of these four goals listed there, they'll go through the five-point process. Start with a challenge. So with that challenge, they're given a scenario, um, specific something that's happening in school, and the teacher works through that module um, so that through that section until they reach the assessment point. So it lasts about an hour and a half, and it's definitely worthwhile. Sorry. teachers at Fairfax County um, are essentially required to take this module. No, this is just a tool that they may use. It, it, it's a, another resource that they can visit if they have a student who is exhibiting areas, um, struggles with the area of self-management. This is something that we could share with them, and if they chose to do on their own, they could, they could use it. Um, the next tool is something that our teachers really love, and we've seen a lot of our teachers using out in the schools. It's GoNoodle.com. I'm sure you've heard of the term brain breaks. Mm -hmm. Well, this is um, something, a, a, it's a website where teachers can go to um, to uh, help teachers and parents get the kids moving with short interactive activities. It provides best side movements to help kids achieve more by keeping them engaged and motivated throughout the day. There's a range of activities to help calm behaviors, relieve anxiety, and <coughs> energy. Do you use those tools? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so lots of great feedback about that one. Um, the next is, next is a self-regulation app. It's called Breathe, Think, Do with Sesame Street. This is going to be tailored to some more of our younger kiddos. Um, this is a resource app for you to share with your child to help teach them skills such as problem solving, self-control, planning, and task persistence. Um, what happens with this app is that they have a friendly monster that's modeling deep breathing and calming activities to help them self-regulate themselves. <coughs> Video modeling for self-management is also a fabulous resource, fabulous tool. Um, the idea behind video modeling is that students are taught how to mimic a behavior, a desired behavior. So they watch a video of someone else doing something, um, of the person doing the targeted behavior, and then they imitate the skill after they've watched it, you know, over and over and over again. Um, is this like example of the videos or something like that? Is that on YouTube or is that on a site that we could go to to find these videos? Is there a site? To, is there a site to go to um, to find videos for video modeling? Um, I'm sure you could Google. <laughs> <laughs> do a Google search, but there's no specific site that we have in mind. Um, you would intentionally do the modeling. You would do the video model. You would do this behavior and then have your students model after you. If you can't find one. Book Creator. Um, this is a really fabulous tool that um, is getting a lot of attention right now. Um, and the reason is, is that the app in Fairfax County was already approved, but now the website has recently become approved also. So Book Creator is a simple tool for creating <coughs> digital books. It combines, with these digital books, you can combine text, images, audio, and video to create things like interactive stories, digital portfolios, science reports, and about me books. <coughs> um, this is a great tool to use to create social stories for your students. Are you not hearing me back there? Um, well, it, it has been closed, but the question is, since they can create science reports and digital portfolios, does that 
integrate with um, the Google suite that students use for their own work? Can they import those hours to a course? Do they create any documents? Depends on how. Depend so, I'm understanding the question correctly. If there's a science portfolio, can it integrate somehow within a Google suite from, from Book Creator, from that in itself? Yeah, yeah okay, so, yeah, so we've never tried that, um, but since this is kind of own separate file formatting, I would doubt that that could happen. Yeah. But we're not sure, and that's not 100% sure. Mm -hmm. And this, again, is available for iOS, Android, and Windows. Okay. Okay. Management. okay, information management. So it's my turn to <coughs> chat with you guys. Um, so I'm going to backtrack a little bit because in our introduction, we had a really good introduction, you know, with describing who we are and all of us and the acronym ATS and assistive technology services came up. So I just want to make sure that you guys knew who we were. Um, how many guys have had interactions with assistive technology services of some type? So I see some in the room. And so, you know, so and what we, you know, giving a broader definition since a lot of you may not have heard of us before. We're the assistive technology group within Fairfax County Public Schools. So we're, we're the, the people that explore assistive technology uses and integrations and how they can be, you know, how we can, they, we can be implemented in the school settings. So a broad array of school settings. Not necessarily just for students with special needs, but any assistive technology that would be, you know, beneficial anywhere. So a lot of the, the items that you see um, that we're talking about today comes from what we call the Fairfax County Digital Ecosystem. You know, so these are tools that, um, and that, that is, you know, described countywide by all facets of the county, where they just, you know, these are the tools that have been vetted, explored, and approved for good instructional practice, and also that's a safe tool in terms of security and privacy. You know, all of that is explored before we go out and recommend them. So, you know, when you're seeing that, there's, I feel, a lot of tools that will do similar function to what you may be seeing, and you may be thinking that yourself, but, you know, they may have not gone through that process, you know, and they're, or they may have gone through that process, and they, uh, you know, they, they may have been, you know, um, you know, deemed as, you know, not a good tool that would fit within the Fairfax County Public Schools digital ecosystem. So I just kind of throw that little caveat, and it'll explain a little bit more who we are. So. You know, we're regularly out there communicating and hopefully, uh, you know, showing these good tools that you're seeing today. So information management, kind of you know, get back on hand here to the task at hand. Um, we see our friend David here from Loudoun County again. David's struggling. He's apparent from, you know, the situation that he's in, but also the bubbles that you see around him. So, you know, any of those pieces where he is really struggling to plan and prioritize the tasks that he needs to do with the information that he's receiving. Look at you guys are doing right now. You're managing all the information that we're throwing at you. And I see that you all have different strategies of doing it. You know, we threw Pear Deck at you at the beginning. So some people prefer to use their computing devices to manage that information for them. Some people like to go to the paper handouts that you have in front of you. Um, you know, Lindsay gave the, the multi-modality, you know, kind of piece to that. You are using multimodal methods to, to manage the information that are in front of you right now, and our students are going to be doing the same. I just looked up the book creator, and it says you can share it in Google. Oh. Cool. So, <laughs> there we go. I haven't tried it, but it says it <laughs> works. And so this is a similar, uh, you know, I guess, could you do, I'm sure SCPS subscribes to Adobe Professional that converts PDF to Word. I mean, I'm sure we'll get to like, approaches with the different academic areas, but so the question is whether or not um, Fairfax County interacts with Adobe products and how they do so, and Alexis answered that question. Yes. Yeah. We'll be talking about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. So um, Jeannie gave you a nice continuum of recommended assistive technologies. We always follow continuum with any approaches and an approach towards information management also. So, you know, electronic methods may not be the most appropriate method, but that's what we're always exploring and looking for with our students on an individualized basis. What is the most, you know, appropriate, individualized um, approach to managing information management for them, you know, according to their own individual need? And so, um, you know, I always like to make things simple and easy. You know, that's always my, you know, kind of mantra with all of that. 
And I feel that, you know, if you're going to use electronic technology, I'm going to use a lot of electronic tools I'm going to show, share with you right now. You know, you take advantage of the features that they have. Take advantage of the features that electronic media can do that traditional paper media may not be able to do and vice versa. So, you know, that's how we look at exploring these tools in the continuum. So information management, kind of like more defined, our students' ability to come up with steps needed to reach a goal. Um, you know, our students may experience difficulty with planning and prioritizing um, tasks that they receive in the classroom, be overwhelmed by those tasks, and, you know, kind, and staying on track with the main idea of classroom tasks that are presented to them. I'm going to really start to break away from the slideshow here now because I'm going to actually show you some of the things and some of the strategies that we employed. Um, the big one that you see right up front, these are our big major players. You know, it's been brought up in questions already. When you see that term G Suite, that means Google Suite for Education. It's probably, you know, the, 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 the most popular and widely used tool with many students in Fairfax County right now and is especially taking root with uh, the FCPS on initiative, you know, where we're seeing more and more students having one-to-one -one access to computing technologies. Um, the Google Suite for Education is a really good productivity tool, you know, to kind of use that on a daily basis. So what we like to do is explore strategies for using that to accommodate information management and executive functioning and other skills that our students may need to work on too. So G Suite isn't necessarily the tool, you know, that would, you know, as a specific tool for information management, it's really the strategy to employ the tool. And that's what we're going to, I'm going to kind of cut away and, and give you just a quick, couple quick demos about. So I'm right now like at another, I went just trying to jump into another web browser and I'm going to go and there's, you know, buttons for our students, there's buttons for our teachers, but they can easily jump into their G Suite for Education, their Google Suite for Education. So I'm logging into mine. Uh, it's always nerve-wracking typing in your password in front of a crowd. <laughs> and even more nerve-wracking that you guys get to see my, my Google Drive. You get to see all of my goods. You know, this isn't a test account. This is live. This is what I work on all the time. And, you know, for our students, I always equate it to a backpack, you know. You open up a backpack and every student's backpack looks differently. Some look great. Some look pretty chaotic. You know, when I get to this place, that can happen here too. But the nice thing about, again, taking advantage of the electronic tools that are available, we might be able to arrange that kind of more quickly and easily. So, you know, if I scroll down a little bit, you can kind of see the arrangement. You, know, you can see there's a lot of, you know, colors, icons, a lot of different stuff that I'm just all kind of automatically saving inside of what is called my Google Drive. That's the first thing I open up and see. With um, Google Drive, if you're not familiar with um, G Suite for Education, the drive is like your flash drive. You know, it'd be like what you're carrying around in your flash drive, except you're not carrying the flash drive. It's sitting in the Google Suite for Education cloud. You know, that is up in the cloud. So when I log on using my logon credentials, what I see here is going to look the same on any device. You know, all of my stuff happens to magically appear for me. Um, it's safely secured in what we call our walled garden for students and teachers. So that if I try to share this outside of an environment in Fairfax County, I'm just not able to do so. You know, the sh sharing is secured that way. Yes? When my daughter graduated, she was telling me about this. She just said, I thought I could keep my Google Drive, but it's all gone. Yeah, so the question, the question is, If you have, a, the question is, if you have a, you know, all of your work created within the Google Drive environment, you know, will it disappear when you leave the Fairfax County Public School System? The answer to that is it doesn't have to. So the account is removed when a student leaves the district, but there is a process for checking out that both students and teachers can do to export their information. She missed the X, yes, yeah. And the second part of that question is, did she miss that? And yeah, she just. Her lack of <laughs> so it is. So you know, it is possible to extract the information. Um, you know, the first piece that I see, just in terms of organization, you guys again, like I equate it to you guys, just right here, right now in the room. You guys are employing your own organizational strategies to the information that's right in front of you. I do the same inside of this environment. You would do it differently, and what you would see on your screen, like your backpack, would look very differently. So, you know, first thing is I have this tool in the upper right-hand corner. 
That just changes the view. I have a preview that's up top, but like what happened down at the bottom, instead of that big long list, I like the list myself. I'm just a list person, but instead now I have these squared icons that give me a preview of my documents. You know, it's just a visual, an additional visual, as opposed to if I hit that button again to toggle it back, I don't. See, it's just, you know, it's not as graphically visual. I like the long list of documents, just as my organizational preference to find the information that I need inside of my Google Drive account. I don't have to make items here. I can upload, you know, things that I'm working on in Microsoft Word or in Inspiration or as we just found out in Book Creator, you know, into this place so that I all have it inside of my backpack, so to speak. Um, another piece of that is, you know, too, is that when I start looking at this, I, you know, I always like to remind people when they're working with Google, remember why Google was first created. You know, Google was a search engine for the internet. So like if this is a mess, your backpack is a mess, that might be okay because you could use the strength of Google to find the things that you, you need to find. So, yes. Are students trained on how to use Google Docs? So, it's student, so the question is, are students trained how to use Google Docs? So there's no specific training or class necessarily for Google Suite or Google Drive, but it's, you know, it's a part of the integration that's now happening, I think, in a lot of classrooms as that technology use is increasing in our classrooms. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you expect him to pick up Google Docs and how to properly use them and so on and so forth? He has one of the worst backpacks. Mm -hmm. right, right. And then you tell him, hey, leverage technology is going to help you, but you don't provide any training. All right. Isn't that too... So, how, so the question is, to repeat the question, so if you have a student that's beginning to use Google Documents, and correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> You know, how do I begin to leverage this? How do I begin to, you know, implement this and explore this how in the classroom? How do you train it to use? How do you train that student to use it possibly? So in terms of, you know, our student beginning to use this, our students that may have some experience in using this, you know, it's really going to start with the classroom teacher and how the assistive technology or the technology is being utilized within that specific classroom. So, you know, there may, what you're seeing in my example is I'm a heavy user. You know, you know, so you're not going to get, uh, you know, it's just the same in the writing, you know, process just in general. You know, you're not going to see necessarily essays coming out of a student the first time they sit down to write. You know, you're in the beginning of that process for word formation, sentence formation, paragraph formation. You know, you're, you're building up to that level. So it may be a gradual process, you know, to, to kind of implore more, you know, technology use. And it depends on the, the culture and the environment of the classroom. And then, of course, you know, we do all that we can to, to communicate and train and discuss these strategies with all schools within the district. Have so hopefully, absolutely, we have a lot of online trainings that, uh, I, I can tell you that mine just, my, my last one just was AT writing tools at your fingertips. And instead of like, and I'm sorry, I just did it. So the question was, do, do, does assistive technology services specifically provide any types of teacher trainings for these types of materials? And my answer is yes, actually. We're, we're very involved with a lot of trainings that are, that are happening out in schools. I just gave the example of a, of a writing training. So when you hear that title, AT Writing Tools at Your Fingertips, it's not necessarily about Google Documents specifically, although we do have those. But of course, we include a lot of these strategies inside of something, a, a training like that. Widely discussed. Um, so no, there's, there's, there's no training in the in type that, you know, professional development module, but we do have a lot of these tools and other tools on the website that Lindsay showed you in the introduction. So our main assistive technology services website, there's two sections in that and ah, I just did it again. So like, uh, are the t there are tools available, you know, for parents, for you guys to see um, that, are, that are training materials that are available. So if you go back to the assistive technology services website that, that Lindsay, you know, provided in the introduction, there are two sections I recommend you guys looking at. It's the uh, assistive technology tools for all learners. You know, you'll see materials there. And assistive technology tools for executive functioning. Can yes. I just have an answer to that? If your child has an IEP, you can go to your case manager and ask for an AT evaluation. And they, in one or two or three uh, bits, depending on how much your child can take at one time, 
will go through and see how your child is responding uh, to different uh, bits of um, executive functioning. And then you can ask for an addendum to your IEP. What is it called? AT evaluation? AT and AT. evaluation. Yeah. Is AT yeah. Assistive technology. It takes a little while because there aren't a lot of people who go and do the, the department is small. Um, and so to send out somebody to do the actual evaluation, but it's very helpful because then they say, okay, in this class, this is what you need the most help in. So writing would be the most help. So then they'll go through and they'll say, these are the things that the child can be using. And that teacher um, has to go through and say, okay, you know, this is what we're gonna use for this child. And, and if the child needs a laptop, the child gets a laptop. Um, that sort of stuff. Thank you for throwing that piece in. You know, and that's absolutely, that's, you know, definitely a, an individualized approach, you know, towards assistive technology implementation. But, you know, with that being said, um, in the spectrum of where we, we provide a lot of our, uh, our technical expertise and, and experience, we, we really have to provide it everywhere, too. So that was within the IEP process. We do that with, outside of the IEP process, too. So both places you can find us. And there was a question in the back. Yes. So the question that just came about was the strategies for success class specifically. Are, are teachers that are participating in teaching strategies for success, do they have access to this information and this and the specific training? So yeah, we're a part of, we, we've worked on them with their curriculum to, uh, to include you know, these types of tools as organizational you know, tools that would benefit their students. So, so yes, so we're a part of that, yes. Another question. So the question is, you know, is assistive technology and assistive technology evaluation, is that for particularly for a younger student? And so we do assistive technology for evaluations for any student in Fairfax County Public Schools. And so the diagram, we kind of steered off topic a little bit and I want to kind of move back on. So, uh, you know, again, just to sh so you guys can see some more of these. And I was getting a wave from over, am I okay? I'm in a good place? Oh, I'm, I'm running I'm, as I do over my time. So, uh, so yeah, so. I'm going to kind of redirect and so, there, <laughs> so to let you guys know though with your questions shelve your questions because there is a place that Lindsay brought up earlier in the pair deck for you know there'll be a question section actually when I'm done and so you can include your questions there and hopefully we'll be able to get to the amount of time that we have so so apologize for that but getting back to Google Drive getting back to that piece um, getting back to what I was talking about in terms of search, um, getting back to my example of the backpack, really backtracking a long way here. If I'm looking for a document, you know, you guys might look for documents on your computers, and you might not remember what they're called. You might not remember where you save them. Of course, in terms of information management, my student might be thinking the same thing. I wrote something about, and I don't know where it is. You know, use the power of Google, use the search feature. So, I know that I might be looking for something and I was talking about an iPad. You know, that's in my head, the word iPad. And I know I got that. So I use my search bar and everything that then populates in that list have iPad in the title, which is great. That might be enough for me. I might be thinking, oh, you know, I just called it something and had iPad and I did correctly title that document and it worked out for me. Might not be that way though. I might have talked about an iPad, you know, in my writing. But then I forgot to include that in the title. So, you know, moving past this little drop down list, if I hit my enter button, now everything that comes up for this list, if I look, the very first thing that I see up top doesn't have the word iPad in it. It says splash top. That means an iPad is talked about in that document. That also happens to be an Adobe document that I see. So I didn't even type it. 
It was a document that I saved inside of my drive that happened to be talking about the word that I'm looking for. And if I open that up, boom, splash top iPad app. There's the word iPad. So the iPad was not in the title. I don't know where this document saved. I can't tell you that right now. It's somewhere inside of my drive. But I just use that as a different type of organizational approach to finding something that I may have lost inside of that messy backpack, so to speak. So just a, you know, kind of another, again, another organizational piece, picking on Google Drive. There are slides about this. Like I said, I'm kind of like running off kilter of the slideshow. Um, another way that we can employ a strategy to use Google Drive, you know, that's out there is a word processor. This also is a good strategy for Microsoft Word is using graphic organizers with the tool. I have one that's pre-made. Bless you. Uh, so, you know, this template is widely available for downloading inside of any assistive technology services location, site, website for all teachers inside of Fairfax County Public Schools. This is an example of a hamburger template. It's a popular template. So, in terms of arranging information, I'm working and struggling with paragraph writing and I'm following the writing process to put a paragraph together. I have a good visual of a, par of a hamburger there that may make sense to me. And I'm following the steps and in only including you know, information on the right-hand side of this graphic organizer to begin structuring my writing. So the first thing that I'm asked to do in the top of my hamburger is to build an introductory sentence. So, let's say our topic is spring break. All right, so for um, spring break, I can't wait for spring break. And I just spit out a sentence, and I'm sorry about that. I just did it in the interest of time, you know, kind of very quickly. You know, so, you know, I can kind of dive into that. Our students may take a little while to kind of formulate those ideas. I just want to show you the quick example of a graphic organizer. Another tool that I could use, as opposed to typing, that's really nicely built inside of Google Documents. This is usually a wow moment. Instead of using my keyboard to type, I'm gonna use my voice to type. So just like you could potentially use with your phone. In your tools menu, you have, ah, my voice typing, which is grayed out because I'm in Firefox. I just lost my wow moment. Yeah. Uh, I went away from the other, uh, the other web browser because we're using the web browser to display the presentation. But I would now like magically say and it's so great because I, I would, could even potentially walk away from the computer a little bit. I don't need a fancy microphone or any extra fancy gear to say, uh, I am. What's that? Oh, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you, though, Lindsay. I am traveling to Florida. Um, you know, to type a few more sentences, I would, was going to say these out, but I'll keep typing boringly in front of you, so I'm sorry about that. Um, all of my family is heading there. And then for my concluding sentence, the days can't go by quick enough. So that's great. You know, I want to, hold on for a second. That's great. I want to now make this into a paragraph. You know, I've just organized my ideas. I was able to generate my sentence because in this particular instance, the student is working on paragraph writing. So all I need to do, again, to take advantage of the things that the technology can do that, you know, instead of rewriting this with paper and pencil, is that, you know, I just go copy that material that I want to still use, just the simple text, and I can move down to another spot inside of the Google document and I'm going to use a different a pasting command. I could do paste or paste special. It's a key command that we talk about. Control shift V instead of control V. And there's the text. So it just extracted the text from the table and didn't recopy the table. And so, you know, there's a lot of good student comfort with this because they're not necessarily re rewriting that by hand again. And they can just take the sentences and rearrange them and omit the ones that they don't want to use. and they have their paragraph. Okay, a couple questions, yes? Where can you get the 
So where can you get the hamburger template is the question. So the, tam the we make that this particular hamburger template graphic organizer widely available as a download in our web resources. So you can find it, um, especially within Fairfax County, like you find it in the intranet site and the internet site. You know, so take a look into those places and it's available for download there to have that initial template. Eight, uh, the, yes, the assistive technology, so the question was to refer, or I guess to reiterate that, the assistive technology services website, and my answer is yes, the assistive technology website. We also distribute it to schools, to teachers, so, you know, we, we propagate it out there as freely as possible. Another question. Just a quick question about the voice to text. It doesn't work with Firefox, Gmail, so it works with Safari, or is it only so the, the question is the, the Google voice typing, does it work, which browser does the, the Google voice typing work? So it only works with the Google Chrome browser, yes. Mm -hmm. Sure. Another question. Can you request that teachers come for training? Because I had to find most of these tools externally. I didn't realize they were on the ATS site. For example, the teachers use PDF versions and for kids with organizational skills. So much better to be able to work on So in terms of so the question, the basics of the question is base, you know, is the uh, is so can can teachers be exposed to this information? And I could say that we try to widely expose everyone, not only teachers, students, whoever else, you know, to any of these tools as much as we can. We think they're great tools to use, and so we'd love to see everybody pick up and use them as much as they can. Do we need passwords to get this? This so the question is. Right. So, so the question is, how do you access Google Drive and Google Documents, correct? Is that what I think the oh, basis right, of that question? Dropbox at home. Yeah. Is that just another method? Right. So, okay. So in terms of how, in terms of accessing Google Drive, um, you can access it if you have a, a Gmail account, just a regular consumer Google account. That is your your public method of accessing Google products. So that's what we would call, call consumer account, your account at home. Your students receive this as a part of being in, inside of Fairfax County Public Schools. So students have a Google Suite for Education account, which is a little bit different than a Google consumer account. So that's that walled garden that I was describing earlier. So your students are in an environment that is secured, so the information that's you know, housed for them only stays within that environment and they share with, among each other within that environment because it's a collaborative tool also. But we can use their suite at home on our home computer. So the question is, can we use G Suite at home you know, on your own computer? So yes, the, the answer to that question is yes, they can use their, their login credentials to log into G Suite for Education from any computer. Okay, I'm going to have to, two more questions, because I, again. That's more of a comment, uh, okay. of, um, being able to access your child's Google Classroom at home, use their username and password, and you'll also be able to find out what's missing, to be able to keep tabs on them to make sure that they are submitting their work on time and correctly, and it's just another mode of checking in. Mm -hmm. Yes, so. What was spoken, you know, up front is that, you know, that y you can access your students, you know, log in and then you kind of backtrack with what your student's doing by logging into their credentials also. Okay, so, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to move on. I'm sorry, again, like field the questions, we'll have, you know, just so we can get to. And again, we'll be around afterwards, so if we don't get to your question within the session time, you know, we should be able to, you know, talk to you, you know, for a little bit afterwards too. Um, so again, another tool, another tool in the, in the Google Suite environment. Um, it really, you know, a lot of I think our tools can kind of blend into these different areas of executive functioning. Um, Jeannie brought up self-management, self-management checklists. There was questions about that. There is another tool that's out there for, uh, for, for in the Google Suite environment. And you can find it in different ways, but I'm just going to do a real quick search. It's easier to find in the Chrome browser called Google Keep. Google Keep is a note-taking tool. 
If you've ever seen Evernote, you know, it's, it, to me that was the first one out of the gate in these types of tools that gives you these kind of, you know, colored notes that you see here. So you see, see some, some of my notes there, some good notes that are up there in front of you. All I have to do to quickly take a note is, you know, I could take a note on paragraph writing. And just like I had with Gene, or uh, I'm sorry, with the, the paragraph template I'm talking and, and writing or typing at the same time, I'm going to make a little kind of reminder organizer here for writing a paragraph. From that piece right now, this is my personal note. Um, I can color the note. You can make it gray. Or is that brown? I don't know. I'm terrible with color. Orange. I think I know that one. <laughs> I think I'm going to go there. I can click on that guy. Bless you. Make this a checklist. So I have check boxes now right beside of it. I don't have to make it a checklist. Make it a bulleted list. You know, so again, we're diving, not diving into that too deeply. Um, I mentioned sharing a little bit. So if I'm a teacher and I want to, you know, this is, might be some individual support that my student may need. I may only want to share it with one person. So I have that share button, that collaborator button. And now, you know, you see my name associated with the note, but, you know, Jeannie might need this assigned to her so that she can structure her own personal paragraph writing. So I'm going to click on that, click save. And that's it. That's it for the note. So Jeannie would have this note in Google Keep for her. I made that note for her. Um, I can also set a reminder for this note, a date and time as to when this is due. So then that, you know, you get an alert through your Google Suite account as a student that Jeannie would know this is be due on a certain day. But when Jeannie goes back into her Google Drive environment, and she goes to write a paragraph, Assume I'm Jeannie now. Or you could assume I'm me, because we would both see the same thing as a shared note. I just made a space for me and my own document. And the notes are integrated as a part of Google Documents now. So if I click there, there's the checklist that I just generated. It just automatically opens up in a side panel for me. Again, a strategy, strategy for using Google Documents. Jeff, is that a new feature? The side piece, the yes. sidebar integration is new as of this year. Okay. Yeah. Google Keep has been around for a long time, as, almost as long as Google Documents. But the side, to me, for our students, the sidebar integration is a game changer. You know, because it's just there. You don't have to look for it. You don't have to type. You don't have to find it. You know, you just click on the yellow box and boom. Anything I generated as a teacher will now be seen by my student. And I can just drag and drop those pieces into my Google document. And I have an ad hoc graphic organizer. It doesn't come up as a checklist, but it comes up as a bulleted list when I do the drag and drop. And so at that point, you know, if I am working and I leave this open, I can actually check off my boxes. And you see what happens when I check off my boxes if I was going to go ahead and complete those sentences as I'm writing them. So you see these lines that are scratched through as I'm completing those tasks. So to me, I'm, I'm really hitting you with, to me, a big concept that to me is diverse and can apply to a lot of different students in a lot of different ways. I'm just showing it in the context of writing a paragraph was just one singular way of applying this type of tool. But there's a lot of good, I think, integration strategies behind using a type of tool like this. So the question was, did, did I import this checklist from another program? So the program that I use, so to speak, is called Google Keep. That's when I went and did that search for Google Keep. Google Keep, when I, when, you know, when I use that bigger, badder term of G Suite for education, that's part of the suite. So if you think of Microsoft Office, I think that a lot of people, you guys are probably familiar with that. Office was a package. You had Word, you had PowerPoint, you had Excel, you had Access, you know, you had other tools that were built inside of the Office suite. 
Google works the same way. There's about, I believe, 18 tools, I think, at last count that we use in our G Suite environment with students. So Google Documents is one of them. We're doing a slideshow now that you guys are looking at. That's Google Slides. Google Keep is another one. So it's just a matter of how these tools, you're using these tools and how they integrate with one another. You know, it's a little bit different of approach than, than Microsoft Office. There's, I think, good and bad, you know, to, to all of them. Could a parent that's not part of the Fairfax County send a note to their child? Uh, so, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Could a parent send a note to their child? Did they have a Gmail account but they're not a teacher? Okay, so the question is, because a parent that, is, that does not have one of these types of accounts send a note to their child that would have a Fairfax County Public Schools account? And the answer is no, because you're outside of that walled garden. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what, what do I need to do? I need to sign up for a little class in, in Google? So, you know, in terms of like, you know, familiarizing yourself, the question is if, if I needed training for you know, the Google, you know, for looking at Google Suite materials, G Suite for education, those types of materials. Really, if you want to really get started quickly, I would just look in with Google, you know, like using Google documents, using, and using the actual Google materials that are out there because Google, the company itself, has a lot of really good tutorials that'll show you things very quickly. You know, the two to five minute tutorials, and they really can start you. Again, I, I showed you everything in my G Suite environment. I'm using it a lot, I'm using it heavily, but if you're opening it up, you're gonna see a blank screen. You know, you have a blank page and you're starting from, you know, scratch. And that may be a little less intimidating. You know, so watch a few things, learn some basics and build off of the basics, just like we would do with any tool that we're beginning to use for the first time. <laughs> well, what our students use, the, the question is, what is it called, basically? Our students use what's in our, in our package, it's called Google Suite for Education. Um, you know, as a consumer, you just have your Google account. It's just your Google, your, 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 your Google environment, basically. So, you know, if you sign up and you have your, your Google account, you would have access to all of the consumer tools, which are a lot more tools. You know, there's tools out there like Google Wallet that we were not going to use with students because we're not requiring students to, you know, keep credit card information, for example. So that tool's deactivated. No sense in having it. So um, when you make these notes, uh, does it always keep the same note will keep coming up with every document that they start, or is that just on the first document and that's it, you make another note? So the question is, when you make a Google Keep note, will it come up on the same document? And my side panel? And the answer to that is in my side panel, the side panel gives me a preview to all of my notes. So any note that I make, if I keep scrolling down, there's an AT writing tools at your fingertip note. If I scroll down further, my next note, FCPS on video. You know, so all of my notes will appear there if I scroll there and look for them. It works in reverse chronological order. So my newest note is up top. Oldest note will be at the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if I'm done with the note, I can put a timer on this, put it, you know, set the checkbox to like be done and say I'm done with it and then you know I can delete the note and then it's not going to appear on my list mm -hmm. in terms of management okay I'm way off track that was this slide <laughs> <laughs> that was this slide so like I've, I've cut to the chase of some of these slides that was also could be this slide. I really get into color coding too much, but if you notice there were color cues inside of my Google Drive account. So of course, color is important for our students in terms of organization. And you know, it's just a real easy change to make to all of the icons that are there, whether I showed you the two views, the grid view or the list view, color will apply. So that can easily draw attention. My summer items, I brightly color myself. You know what I mean? Because that reflects summer. You know, the winter items, they're you know, more blue. You know, so, you know. It, you, that's just an organizational strategy. Oh, and then yes, there's the actual slide for the color coding. So there's you know, the steps that you have in your own handouts. It's just basically a click on making folders because it's just an, another, another organizational strategy to those materials inside of organizing that backpack of Google Drive, so to speak. Okay, some other tools that are out there um, that, you know, that, that we use that are just you know, kind of alternatives to writing. Um, so that might be just kind of an alternative tool to, to, you know, having to sit down and write that paragraph, so to speak, is Flipgrid. I am going to finish up soon. <laughs> so, uh, you know, just to show you a quick Flipgrid video without diving into it too deeply, this, um, this is a Flipgrid example from Oakton High School. 
Does an individual learner please share a story of how a faculty member at Oakden reached out to make a difference in your life? And, you know, we have our student responses here. No specialized equipment needs, just the computer. So, you know, in terms of as opposed to, you know, writing that paragraph, that's just another method of assessing that question. So our students can speak. They just record little videos. You can have it set so that only a teacher sees those videos. You can have it set that everyone sees those videos. And you can make comments on those videos. So it's, you know, it's, it's just a, a video a, um, collabor a collaborative tool, video collaboration tool that um, it's just, again, another example of just really approaching that information differently. Um, Padlet is another piece to that. There's a quick example that's here. To throw a lot at you, you guys are getting hit with a lot of tools very quickly. It's on the list and just the single handout also. Um, this is from a third grade classroom. Can't remember what school. On Famous Americans. So, you know, students were asked to comment on Famous Americans. The teacher structured this electronic board so that you see Thurgood Marshall, Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, Abe Lincoln, George Washington, and student responses are down below, you know, to the assignment that they had them. So everybody sees each other's, um, each other's items as they're being posted in that Padlet board. Um, Quizlet. Uh, Quizlet's a tool that's really kind of nifty to make items. This is an example on goods and services, identifying the difference between a good and a service. A lot of uh, classroom applications for this one. So there's a flashcard that's here. And if we go down a little bit more, you can actually see the examples. So service is defined at first. And if I click on it, a hairdresser is an example of a service. Click back, I get the word. Next flashcard. Another example of a service is a dentist. Click back, whoops. Click back on it. And, you know, go down the list. There's some goods down in here. And there's a good. There's my first good. My flashcard example would be toys. Again, I'm hammering through things a lot quickly. So just a, a elect good electronic tool to present information a little bit differently. Provides a good uh, mechanism for reinforcement of concepts. Um, so Quizlet, I, is Quizlet password protected? They, it does, there is a login. Yeah, Quizlet, yes. that's I thought so, yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's what I know. So the parents, so for Flip Grid and Padlet, the parents can access and they can use them or can create something. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, and that was the question. The question is, is, is Quizlet password protected? Padlet also, is that password protection? The answer is yes. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of, I need to answer to you. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> um, a lot of teachers, they don't have to use a specific student account with a login. A lot of teachers, when they're in the elementary school, they just send the link out to their Padlet. The kids click on the link, and then they're into the um, Padlet or the Flipgrid. So it's a lot of link sharing instead of going through and logging in um, to an account. But there is a username and password that you, that you can tie to those accounts. Another a little uh, nifty tool that's quick and easy, that is quick and easy, that I can show very quickly, is the Mozilla Reader View. Um, this is a tool that's automatically built into the Mozilla browser, the Firefox browser, just a different web browser. Um, so if I go back, and I'm showing you all my good stuff here, but I'm going to go to a site. This just kind of happens in, in Firefox automatically. And the site has to identify as to whether or not it's an article to be read. And of course, our students may be reading electronic articles from time to time. So one student site that's a student news site that you know I kind of jumped to as an example, is Dogo News. And so it is that. It's, it's uh, current events and news sites for students, for kids. And you can see its arrangement you know, is kind of efficient. There's nothing that really looks anything different right now. Um, so this article, to me, just jumped out. Like the first one that caught my eye was the South African diver's miraculous escape from a whale's mouth caught on camera. So yeah, I got to check that out. <laughs> so you know, for our students that are viewing this, a lot happens on a web page. You know, and this is just a quick and easy strategy to clear that up very quickly so that we get to what our students need to get to, and that's the information that they want to see in front of them. So what is very subtle, and what happened when I finally clicked on that article that doesn't happen on other sites, is that I get this little icon in the upper right-hand corner that looks like um, a, a news page. And you can see it just says, when I hover over top of it, it's kind of hard to read. But for those in the back, that says toggle reader view. And if I click on it, all of that exchange stuff's gone. So that's the first nice piece. You're like, I just get to the goods. 
I didn't have to install anything. I didn't have to log into anything. I didn't have to do anything special. That just automatically appears in the Firefox browser. And I get additional tools that are built in there also. So, whoops, that was the original. I didn't mean to toggle back from the review. I went to hit the one below it, which are, you know, changing my fonts. So, you know, some of our sites, I can pick on Wikipedia. They like to use fonts, you know, with those serifs, with those tails. So that can really be hard for, harder for our, on our students' eyes, you know, um, with any visual disability or dyslexia. And changing the font, toggling the font, I'm just doing that at a click of a button. And I'm doing it for you guys right now. You guys in the back are going to appreciate this. With a click of a button, I make it bigger. You know, I'm not doing anything special. It's just all built in. I can also change then the word spacing. Click of a button. Or I can bring it closer together. Um, I can change then my line spacing. And I'm going to go down to the, the more intense text down here. And you can really see that line spacing stretch out. Make it more reader friendly. Yes. Is Firefox used in a classroom as a browser? It is available in Fairfax County as a browser. Okay, but usually they're using Chrome. It, so then the second part of that question is they're usually using Chrome. And, and so the, the, yes, so, that, so the answer to that question is usually, but it doesn't mean it's, we're limited to using Chrome. In fact, like I said, what didn't work for me, you saw what happens, and there's always a choice in the types of tools that we're using and the reason that we're using them. So Google voice typing did not work for me when I chose to use Firefox, so I would choose to use Chrome in that case. So the reader view would not work for me when I did when I use Chrome. So I would choose to use Firefox in that case. So the student would have to advocate to have both those browsers and know which one. So a student could do that. It could. It could be yeah. Could also could also be initiated from a teacher though too. You know, if a teacher you know knew of those tools also. Um, I can change the color hues. And you know, just made that from light to dark, dark to light. And then there's the sepia, which is more subtle. And then I also have a reader, a built-in reading tool, text-to-speech. And let me get to a place here where I can highlight a sentence. And I click my reading tool. In early February 2019, 51-year-old Rainer Schimpf and his team set out to film South Africa. For me, Rainer Schimpf would have been a tough word. Resources. All right. I didn't mean to hit click and hit all the way to the bottom, but I did. Um, you could change those voice rates, uh, speech rates. You could change the voices. So you get some flexibility that's just automatically built in. Quick, easy at your fingertips. I'm a fan of simple and easy, and at your fingertips. You know, so again, so those are the last tools that I'm going to show you, but I do want to make mention of some others. Um, um, Rewordify is a way to change, quickly change language. It's just a website, no login required. Um, you know, you can take text from Wikipedia. That would have been my example. Place it in, uh, I like to use, you know, science terms here, mitochondria, you know, uh, you know, some big, heavy, intensive words, and just copy and paste that body of text from something like Wikipedia. And I'm picking on Wikipedia just because it's just the obvious example when you come up first in a search, not, I'm not recommending it. Um, and, you know, and then it will reword then the vocabulary to, you know, uh, um, uh, and it just kind of finds it automatically based on its own algorithms. So there's no really control over it. Text Compactor simplifies those passages. So if I had a three paragraph package, paragraph on, or package, excuse me, of text from, you know, talking about mitochondria, I want to bring that down to one paragraph, and the executive summary, so to speak, and highlight key points. This tool does that automatically for you. Again, quick and easy online tool, no login required. We have additional graphic organizers available, Inspiration and Inspiration Maps, as well as you know, building graphic organizers inside of other Google tools and other uh, Microsoft Office tools that we have out there. And of course, then they can apply to math then also, because I picked on writing specifically in my examples, but they're out there for other curriculum topics too. So thank you, and I'm sorry. And uh, we are at a spot to type in a question. So if you are on your uh, Pear Deck on your electronic device, feel free to go ahead and, and type in a question there as we switch mics.
All right. In the interest of time management, I'm going to move on. So we all know this study, the time management. Time management. I think we all know it's a very essential skill at school. There's our continuum. We start with checklists. We go all the way down to web-based planning tools. There's some good checklists online that create them already for you. You can click on that link to take, check it out. You can do the list in Microsoft Word, Google Keep, um, and Google Calendar. You can do that too. Remind app is an app that a lot of teachers use um, to remind the, te the parents and the students things to do. The iStudies Pro is a great app. It's an electronic agenda for students and adults. And then the time timer, you've probably seen this in, in classrooms, but there's an app for it, which is great. ChoiceWorks is, is a really good app as well. It gives you the visuals. You can do a schedule. You can do a waiting and a feelings option. And then the first, then visual schedule. So you got to do this first, then you got to do that. And it's visuals. And we're doing a mic check. <laughs> all right, guys. <laughs> Had to get my mic on. Um, all right, so again, we have David. Um, so we're going into materials management. Um, your child or a student, if you have in the classroom, may struggle with some of these things that David um, is talking about in this first slide. So what is materials management? It's the ability to keep your workspace and materials orderly. I know I'm sure a lot of your kiddos, um, backpacks and desks and lockers and things um, may not be as orderly as we would like them. Kids rooms as well, I'm sure. Um, understand what materials are needed for a specific task. So just like in the very beginning of our introduction, we saw Scott and how Scott was saying that he goes to class but doesn't have his binder or he's forgotten his pencil. Um, so things like that. They go to their class, they're transitioning between different classes and they show up to math class without their math binder or without last night's homework. Um, so making sure that they have their materials needed for that class so that they are ready to learn when they get there. Um, and being able to find and utilize what is needed for a task. I know I've gone into classrooms and sometimes my kiddos' desks are a mess and I'm like, where's such and such? And I'm pulling papers <laughs> left and right out of there. So keeping things orderly so that they can readily find what they need to complete the task um, in the classroom. So students um, who have a deficit in this area um, may lose or fail to turn in their homework or classwork. Um, they can't start or complete a task because they don't have the items needed. So if the teacher has to then send Scott back to his locker to go get his, his uh, math binder, he's losing instructional time and time to be using um, in classroom to work on that assignment. Um, not sure how to eliminate items they no longer need. Uh, I'm sure maybe some of you have kids that they have stuff from September that's still in their binders and folders and things. We no longer need those in class, so one strategy um, is to take those things out and leave them at home into another binder or another folder so that they can reference them later, but they're not carrying it and shuffling it to and from school every day. So just honing down on what you need for that specific quarter. Um, and feeling overwhelmed by too much stuff. Just like you guys are feeling overwhelmed right now, by too much stuff <laughs> and trying to weed through what you need. You're welcome. And that's the thing. We know it's very overwhelming. There's a ton of tools and things available. Um, and so I'm going to try to finish up quickly so that we can answer some of your questions. Um, this is a very meaty um, presentation. Um, that's why you guys have the presentation in front of you to be able to make notes. Um, and if you have any questions, I don't know if Jeff mentioned this, but Every single school in Fairfax County Public Schools has an assistive technology resource teacher um, assigned to that school. So there, our department, everyone has one. If you don't know who that person is to get in contact with, the department chair, the lead teacher, your student's special ed teacher, case manager, um, should know who that is to get in contact with them. So every school has one. We're out there all the time um, visiting our schools on a regular basis. All right, again, we look at the continuum of considerations. So 
for materials management, we're looking at low-tech organizers, we're looking at folders, we're looking at binders, um, container systems. So maybe in my locker at home, I have a red container where I put my A-day stuff or my blue container for my blue day stuff. Um, coding system, Jeff spoke about this, that color coding folders, um, taking it a step further that we always think about color coding as colors. It does not necessarily need to be colors. Um, under the color coding umbrella, you can have certain stickers. So say all of the flower stickers are going to be your A day or going to be your English. Um, you can also look at it as um, say they have a favorite character and you buy their character binders for different classes. So it's not necessarily like yellow, green, and blue. It can all, as long as they're all coordinated and they go together, that's another way to color code a system for, um, for your student. Um, electronic filing storage, that's what we spend a lot of time on in um, the G Suite, um, as well as Microsoft. Um, and then some computer-based tools that we're gonna get into. So low-tech essentials, the old school trapper keeper. I don't know if you guys have that. That was like the cool thing to have is a zipper. Um, they are wonderful, they still work. They are great. If you have a child that has a hard time putting it into three-hold rings or putting it in the side pockets, getting it in a contained system, if we can just get it zipped up in there, hopefully it will come home, right? Um, so looking at maybe they need a zipper, um, a zipper binder. They do have, I'm sure you guys know, being out there at Staples and Walmart and Target getting school supplies, they do have in binder hole punchers. So that's a great tool to put it in the binder with them so when they get a loose piece of paper, they automatically three hole punch it and put it in the three rings. And they're very inexpensive. Um, and then, as I spoke about already, separating binders and folders into each subject. This is uh, student by student. Some students, they are overwhelmed by having one folder or binder for every single class. Some students do better by having one binder and one folder for this day, like a take home folder and binder, and then one binder and folder for this day. If you're doing A days or B days, if you're in like middle school and high school, um, sometimes having one for every single subject becomes very overwhelming. So we really want to find the best system for our kiddo. Natural Reader. So this is a free text-to-speech online um, website and app. Um, every student in Fairfax County Public Schools has access to this. It is um, pushed down from the T-Specs, which is the technology special, specialist for the school. Um, and so it's found in their My Applications folder. And it's free for you guys. If you want to go to naturalreaders.com, you guys can download it at home. Um, it's very simple. You highlight text, press play, and press stop. Um, it reads anything that can be highlighted or copied. If it comes in as a PDF, it comes in as an image, um, these things will not be read. Only if it, only if it realizes that there's text on the page. Um, we have been doing um, some of this natural reader um, for many, many years, um, using this as the read aloud accommodation practice for the e-card and SOLs. So a long time ago when the e-card test rolled out, for some of the teacher made tests, there wasn't the audio component. So this is what we found um, that was the best way to get them ready and get them practiced for their SOLs with the audio. Now a lot of those tests are already built in with the read aloud features in them. Um, but this is a good thing at home if you're trying to prepare for the SOLs, um, putting the headset on, listening to the audio. It gives the student um, control over how many times they need to listen to their, um, their text. I know sometimes when they have read on demand um, or it's read to them um, by proctor, sometimes they can be embarrassed that they need it read multiple times. So this gives them a little more ownership and control over how many times and no one knows how many times it's being read to them because they have their earphones on. Microsoft Word, you guys not, might, might not have known this, but Microsoft Word has had a speech feature into it. It's been, it was, you had to dig into the tools to get it, but it's been there for many, many years. Now with Office 365, they now have the read aloud right there on the review tab um, for students. It also works in Outlook and some of the other um, Microsoft um, applications. You can adjust the speed rate. You do have those Microsoft vo voices, I think it's, there's a female, I think it's David is one, and there's a female um, that you have the choices to. So you'll have two voices and they're really good. Um, sometimes with our synthesized text, it can be really robotic, but 
we've come a long way with those that they are really doing a nice job adding these read alouds that students are understanding. Um, just like that guy's name, Fimf, whatever it was. It read it really nicely um, for our students. Adobe Reader, I know someone had a question about this um, earlier. So students have access to Adobe Reader on their laptops, um, in the classroom, desktops, um, as well as teachers have access to it. Um, so Adobe Reader does have an app component, but it also has it built into the computer. So Adobe Reader, there is a comments um, tool in there that allows them to annotate on PDFs. So if you have your kiddos that have paper worksheets and they need to be able to um, write their text on there, highlight, do call outs of symbols, circle things, um, they can be scanned into a PDF, used with Adobe Reader, the comments tool, um, and so that they can do those. Adobe Reader is free. If you don't have it at home, you can purchase it. Adobe Reader Acrobat, that's the one from Adobe that you have to purchase um, a yearly license. But Adobe Reader is free and available. Yes, ma'am. So, you, so the question is, does Fairfax County Public Schools have the Adobe Acrobat feature to convert it back to Microsoft Word? Or, or any text or, it exists. I've used it enormously as an educator, mm -hmm. but I don't want to pay any more. And I don't want to pay any more. So I don't want to pay any more. Right. But I'm sure that FCCS has a subscription. So um, that is going through the IT office, I believe. The there's no full version of Adobe in Fairfax County. Sorry, Jeff can, Jeff, Jeff, yeah, they've gone away from that because I think of the subscriptions that have happened um, that, we, that we just have access to Adobe, Adobe Reader. Um, we'll save that question to the end because Jeff can get into the te technicalities of it. I wanna get through so I can give everyone the chance because I know we told you guys to hold your questions to the end. So the ones that have been holding on to them, I wanna give you a chance to be heard. Um, Mayon. You guys have probably heard of Mayon. Mayon is at the school level. If you um, have students, they can receive their online books through Mayon. Um, that is a school-based login. So they would need to contact, I think, the librarian um, to get the students, uh, the school's login and password. These are, um, uh, what's the word? No. Trade books, yes, not textbooks. And then we have Bookshare. So Bookshare is, is an accessible online library um, for students that have print disabilities. There are over 500,000 titles available. Um, it does provide text-to-speech voices. There is a free membership for 504 and I, IEP kiddos. Um, parents can get the free account. Um, some schools have subscribed to Bookshare um, over the years, and so they may have a Bookshare account already um, if they need one. That's not a problem to get them a Bookshare account for the school. Um, Learning Ally is another, um, another way to get students accessible text. Um, the library is 80,000 and they are human read audiobooks. Um, these are free for students who qualify through AIM Virginia. So Accessible Mas Materials Virginia um, is what they would qualify under to get Learning Ally. You can purchase it separate, but the county will provide it if they do qualify under AIM VA. Audio note, this is a great note taking and voice recording app. There is a PC version as well as an app for that. Um, there's visual tracking. It allows the students to type text, um, handwrite, draw, and insert photos um, into, um, into their notes. Hyperdocs, I'm sure you guys may have seen these. Um, a lot of teachers are creating hyperdocs. They are digital lessons designed in Google Docs um, that contain um, innovative things such as instructions and links and tasks for them to complete. And it's all housed into one sheet. So they're not going, you know, open this web browser, open that web browser. It's contained within one document and they work their way through um, their document for that lesson. It provides opportunities to collaborate, communicate, um, and think critically about the task. And you can see over there about the solar system, that's just an example, how it works them through the process of the solar system. Um, as an example there, 
Claro PDF. This is an app only. Um, this allows um, a student to uh, take a piece of paper, convert it to a PDF, and they can, just like Adobe Reader, and they can annotate on it. All right, if you guys have any questions and you're still on Pear Deck, you guys can enter your questions now. All right. Also, um, on the last page of your handout, there are our links to some of our resources that we talked about today, understood.org, the WADI, where we're pulling those four sections of executive functioning from. Um, there is the AT executive functioning site. Um, I did want to show you guys, I'm kind of going off script, but I did want to show you because Jeff has been talking tremendously about teacher resources. We have our intranet page. This is behind the wall garden that Jeff has been talking about. Um, so you guys have access to the public. This is behind locked doors, so to speak. Um, and students have, I mean, teachers have access to all the resources that we put out from our department. So if you, if they were to go to AT resources, we have a plethora of things to work them through for executive functioning here, um, different um, ways to use, say, Google organizers with Google drawing. Um, let me go back here. Technology tools to support all learners. We have everything broken out into keyboarding, math, organization, reading, writing, and some other supports. Um, so they can come here and if they need extra training or if they need to um, uh, get some ideas of how to implement it in the class, we have them here for them. So we do offer tons and tons of resources um, on our intranet website for our teachers and staff. Uh, it's on the intranet site. So if, they, if you just tell them to go on the ATS intranet site, um, they should be able to search it and Google it um, that way. All right. We have, yep, teachers. This is teachers' resources. I know that Jeff was fielding questions about teacher training. This is our teacher website, um, so to speak, and our staff website. They can go on here. We are creating resources all the time and posting it. So they do have a way to come in here and learn about Google, get some implementation tricks and tools that they can use in the classroom. We have 10 minutes. <laughs> 10 minutes here. Jeff's got the mic. Um, so. There was one last slide here, if you guys are still in Pear Deck. Um, how well did you understand the information? If you guys want to go in here and rank it um, and let us know, that would be great. Yep, and then I'll go back. Sorry. Go back here. If I show responses, we have one. Yeah. Um, Sorry. And then if we go to the end one. Maybe we have more there. Um, Pear Deck, like I said, is a tool that um, was just approved. So um, you may be hearing about this from your, your students that they are using this and interacting with their presentation. Um, there you go. So you guys can see it in real time here and scroll. So there are a bunch of tools built into this um, for the students to interact with um, their teacher's presentation. All right, so we've got about 10 minutes um, before our session time is over and we will be staying a little bit longer, I'm sure, for questions um, from you guys. So the, the first question, I'll take the first one from Pear Deck and then we'll field one, we'll just kind of shift back and forth so that way, you know what I mean? The, so I see the one that's forming. Is there any way that parents can access the tools available to teachers? I have supplement teacher work, particularly writing, that would benefit from access to these tools. So all the tools that are on that list, the parent handout that you have, um, the, the PowerPoint slideshow that you have in print, you know, we we're, were hopefully showing you tools that you would be able to easily access to. So we didn't get to dive into them. I dove into some probably too much, you know, and then that became overwhelming. I mean, I think that's what you're finding is that a lot of these tools and strategies, you know, they are taking time to implement and explore, and it really depends on the individual need of the student. <coughs> you know, I encourage you to take some additional time outside of today and explore the tools that we've mentioned that are on that list. And of course, you know, those are the tools that are part of that Fairfax County digital ecosystem that we recommend that you try using at home, too, if you're interested in using those at home. So you certainly can use all the resources that we showed you today. 
So what lens you choose? Yeah, so um, would hyperdocs work well for a multi-part part assignment? This is the structure of and the reasoning behind hyperdocs is that it will allow them to work through multiple parts of a subject. So it's all contained. So it's they are working at their own pace, they're interacting. Um, so it is going through a large lesson and giving them information and um, ways to work themselves through. It could go out to websites, they could have some writing assignments, but it's all housed within one document so they're not all over the place. So it's actually managing a lot of that material that they're giving like we've given you, but just in one document um, per se. And the second part of that, what is your top recommendation planner for middle schools and then specifically, you mentioned a device with Apple Watch and iOS access. So I, I like, I can tell you my personal preference is to not necessarily focus on the device and the operating system. Use what's going to work anywhere. You know, so some of the strategies, that's why another reason I you know, kind of dove into the G Suite the way that I did with you guys. You know, take advantage of the features in there because they will work on any device. They will work on your iPad, they'll work on your iPhone, they'll work on your Android phone, they'll work on your computer's, you know, or your computers at school, your Windows computer at school, to work on your Windows computer at home. You're accessing that same drive environment everywhere that you log in. There are differences maybe between the apps, just to warn you, like an iPad app for Google Documents, and then the full version, so to speak, that on a website, but you can still access the same materials for the most part. But with that being said, we have one, um, uh, there's the, also another organizational tool in that G Suite package is the Google Calendar. I have Alexis pointing to that one. <laughs> And then one that's iOS specific, since you asked the iOS question, because sometimes there are those tools that are out there that only work in one environment. So it's unique to that device. You won't be able to use it necessarily everywhere. It's on that device, it's uh, a tool we mentioned called iStudies Pro. And that's on that list in the handout that you have. So there's, which uh, we'll go yeah. for. Mm -hmm. what, what device would you recommend or tool for a student who's given a paper exam and it's got a big lengthy question and they have a hard time reading because they have dyslexia, what can they do in that situation? Do anything you talk about to help in that situation? So when the specific okay. question yeah. is, if you have a lengthy question on a paper exam, what strategy would you recommend for hearing that question back and writing or both? More hearing, having some, he's afraid to ask for someone to come read the question to him. Uh -huh. Is there some kind of tool that he could use with so in terms of reading the question back and hearing the question, so you're converting that from paper. I, I'm sure that you have four different people here, then there's, there's a lot of strategies that we can take for that. So um, one, one of the things that just comes to mind just right out of the gate is you know that our copiers inside of all of our school buildings are also scanners. So we can just take that document and scan it, it becomes a, a PDF file, and a lot of the readers that were mentioned here can read that question back. So um, the your natural reader can read that back. Um, uh. Yeah, natural reader is a great way. That's how we've been doing some of these like e-cart tests and getting them practiced for the SOLs. Um, so getting that electronic version and then having the natural reader um, read it to them and read it aloud. Yep. So it's also it's based on what's in his IEP if he has the read aloud accommodations and how it's written um, in their IEP. But I would talk to the case manager and just ask about you know getting electronic um, tests for him and that it can be read with a um, text to speech reader. And so the suggestion that was mentioned is to provide a good parent gateway into all of these tools. You gave the analogy of the concussion. You know, it sounds like they did a good job communicating. Probably something very specific. So I, you see in probably in this presentation when we're doing the live conversation with it, we're throwing a lot out there. There's a lot of tools and a lot of strategies. So we do have a public website that is, you know, the, our, our tools, and that's what Lindsay showed you very quickly our tools, then this is our public website <coughs> for executive functioning specifically. We're always working on this. These tools are always changing. Um, you know, Alexis looked to me when I kind of sat back down and said, I didn't know there was sidebar integration for Google Keep. Keep, that was the first time I saw that. And you know, 
as an assistive technology resource teacher, that's coming from her. Oh, great. So it's, it's just, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's all of us. That's all yeah. of us with these particular subjects and topics, and you know, with technology, it is the field. These changes happen when they happen. I can tell you, working with Google a lot, like all of a sudden you like open your Google Drive one day and something's different. The, and there was no communication or announcement necessarily. And we're in turn then examining and exploring how to, to integrate it into classrooms, how to communicate that back out. We're trying to take advantage of those mechanisms too. So it's, to me, it's a, it's a very broad, meaty topic. We've used that word over and over again. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to do that as efficiently as possible, but it's, it's certainly sizable. So we want to do that as best we can, and we'll, of course, take any suggestions and appreciate yours. And, and every name's on the website, yeah. so email me at any point. And everything that we show today um, is on the public intranet site between the two, um, between executive functioning website and tech tools for all learners learners here so if you click on here we have keyboard and resources organization so if you need more information on google calendar if you click out here what can calendar do it walks you through how to schedule events how to create an event so we do have things out here for you that if you need to click through and and get a little more um, in depth about how to use it so get started with google keep you click on here how do i use google keep so it's here, it's just you have to go to the public website between those two, um, those two uh, web pages. Um, the, the PBL uh, checklist that um, Jeannie spoke about, it's here. Um, if you need more information on AIM Virginia, Bookshare, Maya, and Learning Ally, it's all here and they link out to the specific. There's also some video tutorials here that we put on here. They're very quick. Um, if you want to know how to do the Speak Tool in Microsoft Word, um, the text compactor that we talked about, uh, writing resources, we do have video tutorials on how to do the Google, talk, Google Docs tables of text. You saw that hamburger template with Jeff, it's right here, it walks you through how to do that. Um, Google voice typing that Jeff wasn't able to do because he was in Firefox. There's a video tutorial here, there's also, if you click on here, it walks you through how to activate that. Type with your voice, step one, turning your microphone, step two. How do you type with it? How do you add punctuation? What are the voice commands? So it's all here on the public web. You don't need to um, do on the internet behind the wall garden. We do have some templates and things that aren't on the public just because of the way that um, our, web, our web pages are locked down. Um, but we do provide as much information and transparency for our tools that you guys can use at home. You just go to the public website, click on both of those, and everything we talked about today is here. Um, even those, um, graphic organizers for math, they're here as well um, that we didn't have time to go and show. And they're downloadable templates right here. So go to the Tech Tools for All Learners and the Executive Functioning web pages on our ATS website.